Spurge here to welcome you to the eighth episode of season seven of High Side, Low Side. I am joined as always by Zach Quartz over there in my co-pilot seat. We have an episode about electric motorcycles and we're joined by Ryan F9 to talk about them. In addition to that, the not the news today is around a look back at Stark Varg and whether they're delivering on promises. And we have a comment about wanting some insider tips on how to play the Rev Trivia guessing game, all that and much, much more, but very, very first and foremost, we need to get an award from our sponsor. We often talk about uh, Motul's cleaners and lubricants for motorcycles. Spurgeon, in particular, needs these things because he's a grubby Neanderthal, as we all know, and his motorcycle needs maintaining. I, on the other hand, uh, was just reaching for some product this morning and needed to clean my helmet, use some of that lovely Motul helmet cleaner that we talked about a number of episodes ago, and then my leather boots were a little scuffed and nasty, so I, I reached for the Motul leather cleaner. Uh, Two friendly reminders. One, that Motul makes things other than motor oil. And two, they sponsor this program. Um, so you should probably go to revzilla.com slash Motul to learn more about all the products that Motul makes. That's revzilla.com slash M-O-T-U-L. And just a reminder, every time you make a purchase over on revzilla.com, it helps Zach and I put programs like this into the motorcycling Ether. So just keep that in mind. Every time you support Revzilla, you're supporting original content on the Revzilla YouTube channel. And if you want more incentivization for doing something like that, you can check out the RPM program at Revzilla, which stands for Riders Plus Membership, which gives you all kinds of additional benefits, including discounts just for being a member. So check out and learn more about that program at revzilla.com slash RPM. Let's move on with the show. Okie dokie, everybody. Here we go. Um, first things first, as, as usual here on High Side, Low Side, we got to uh, jump into a not the news topic. And this one is, uh, this is a follow-up to um, something we talked about many episodes ago. I actually, I'm sure Chase put it in the episode document which episode we actually talked about this. I have... I have completely forgotten at this point. However, Season 5, Episode 5, Off-Road thank Spectacles. Thank you, Spurgeon. We talked about the the, um, the company Stark Ventures, um, which is a Scandinavian company, I think. Is that right? Sweden, mm -hmm. or Swedish, maybe? Swedish, Whatever. Yeah. Um, making a dirt bike called the, the Stark Varg. Um, there is a lovely first ride review by our friend Tucker Neary over at uh, Common Tread at Um And we also talked about Stark... Um, I think briefly when um, Royal Enfield, Iker Motors, a, a sort of AK in the motorcycle world, Royal Enfield invested in the company. What we're circling back on was the claim that there would be, what, 15 months, Spurge, to, to when they would ship motorcycles? Yep. So we marked the calendar and uh, they, they claim to have sold under, they say they claim to have sold a thousand motorcycles at under 24 hours at $15,000 each. Um, and then they were talking about deliveries of those motorcycles would happen within, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 15, 15, 15 months. I hope that our producer has started the, the clock at this point because I, I, we got to remind each other that we have three minutes to do the Not the News and there's a game going. Um, mm -hmm. So starting the clock officially now. So if you're, if you're playing officially by the rules, the clock has begun. <laughs> um, so Zach and I put a, a, a big X on the calendar for May 1st, twenty twenty. Three. That was when the 15 months uh, would be up, and we figured this would be a great not the news to discuss for our electric bikes episode with Ryan from Fortnite. Sure. So did and they hit, did they deliver, Zach? That's what we're trying to figure out. Right, and specifically we marked this on our calendar because I think we said we made the claim in season five that if Stark, you know, Stark sold a thousand motorcycles, and isn't that great? But let's check back and we'll see how many have been shipped when May 1st, 2023 comes around, and if I had to, if I had to put money on it, I would say that there aren't going to be any shipped, and we're going to give Stark Varg a big old "I told you so" because it's just more vaporware in the world of motorcycling. And shame, shame, shame on you, Stark Varg for uh, Stark Ventures. Did we this. bet anything on this one? Remember that time that you I had to wear a so. clown's outfit for the entire episode because you lost <laughs> yeah. a bet to me? Yeah, what was the bet I lost? It doesn't I matter. I don't even remember. We only but got I think three we minutes could, to talk about Stark that. Ventures. Let's, stay let's, focused. Let's, let's pull stay up the picture focused. of Zach in the clown's okay. outfit right now for me, Bernie. Uh, that would be great. Or, actually, we have a new editor. Matt Fells is editing these now. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> we, I don't think we bet anything. Did they or did they not deliver motorcycles by May 1st? Based on what we Based can find. Based on our internet research, Stark Ventures has indeed started shipping 
motorcycles to customers. Evidently, one of the first customers was in the good old U.S. of A. Uh, so we can't give we can't give Stark Ventures a big old "I told you so" because it does appear uh, uh, allegedly bikes are being shipped. Um, uh, I don't remember exactly what we said. However, we would, we would but, but certainly not all thousand have been have been shipped. Well, and uh, and I think that the the grasp on this um, magical dirt bike market is still tenuous, in my opinion. They did not ship by May 1st. We saw a report came out that they were shipping on May 3rd. Now, no, that was, when the, that was when the report came out. Oh, uh, okay. But I think, the, I think the report came out after they shipped the bikes. Okay. I think we're also, we're splitting hairs a little bit by a couple of days, you know? I, like, was going to the give the, I was gonna say that we're not gonna hold that against them because they okay, did okay, what they yeah, said yeah. they were gonna do. Um, <laughs> my, but my point, in, in when Zach and I were talking about this, in wanting to discuss this is about the news is I am hoping that in our vast high side, low side audience out there, um, all, you know, Baker's dozen of you, that somebody has purchased a Stark Vark. It would be really interesting right. to hear because we, we have people that do listen all around the world. So whether you're in America or somewhere else, if you've, if you are one of the first thousand to have bought a Stark Varg, we would love to get an email from you. How do you like it? Is it, the fifteen thousand dollar value you thought it was going to be. Are right. you excited about your purchase? Is it delivering in the ways that it was right. trying to set expectations to do? How much? How much heavier is it than the bike that oh. you that you put down the deposit for? These are timers up. Okay, timers These up. These are good questions. These are good questions uh, to ask. And yes, we would love to hear from you. So to 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 circle back just quickly, mm -hmm. or to to close it out. We may, I think what we said was. If they haven't delivered whatever fifteen million dollars in, in in motorcycles um, by the time this clock has expired, then you know we get to say, blah blah blah. You're just another electric um, vaporware. Yeah, tease in the world of motorcycling. But I think you know we we I think realistically we're excited to see these bikes make it to people's garages, and uh, we hope that um, the sh the shipping continues. Yep, but we got we got one eye on you, Stark Ventures. Just letting you know, we're keeping our we're keeping our peepers peeled, people. Uh, so <laughs> if you bought a Stark Varg, shoot us an email to highside lowside at revzilla.com and give us the <laughs> lowdown. Um, but with that being said, we're already talking about electric bikes. Let's get Ryan from Fort Nine onto the program and kick off this discussion around EV two wheeled transportation. There he is, everybody. Ryan Fort Nine. I I still can't believe that that is your uh, family name. What a coincidence. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, either way, thank you so much for joining us to talk about motorcycles. You are, um, of, of course, known across the internet for being quite a bit smarter than we are. So we're excited to have your brain power here to talk about electric motorcycles. I don't know about that, but I'm happy to, to lend whatever <laughs> brain power I can bring to things. Right on, so right on. we're going to quick, we're going to kick things off. Typically we do a, a lightning round with new guests. Ryan, you're a returning guest, a fan favorite. So we're going to do what's called a thunder round um, <laughs> because that's what comes after the lightning, presumably. Nice. And really this is going to be a bit of a brief catch up, <clears throat> but also some questions about what you've been doing in, in motorcycling, you know, since we've talked last. So my first question for you is that it looks, it seems uh, to appear that you have bought a new personal motorcycle. And is it true that you are now the proud owner of a Ducati Desert X or is that just internet fodder? Mm. <laughs> Small amount of movie magic going on there. Um, the brass at Fort Nine uh, purchased a Ducati. Uh, all my personal bikes are uh, in sort of the sub two thousand dollar range because that's the only way I can afford to own like five six of them at once. Um, <laughs> so uh, no, uh, no personal Desert X, but uh, I can get on a Desert X uh, oh, when I like to. The the white Beamer we had was a company bike as well. Actually, hmm. um, frequently spoke about it as if it were my own. So. <laughs> but, uh, a bit you... of a liar like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Well, I'm glad you know your words, not mine. Did um, <laughs> did you do you ever run into that with? Uh, I assume occasionally you're at a you're at a cafe, um, enjoying brunch with your lovely family, and someone says, "Well, Ryan Fortnite, you're my favorite YouTube host." And do they ever say like, "You, what's it like to own your BMW?" And then do you fess up or do you just say like, "Oh, it's great. I like that bike. Yeah, nice to meet you there, Jim." Yeah, yeah. Um... Usually that one, um, because practically <laughs> it never made much difference. Um, I would yeah. 
you know, ride that, uh, ride that Beamer as if it were my own. Sure. Um, but, uh, but if the conversation got going a little deeper than it, I would usually fess gotcha. up and say, Hey, you gotcha, know, this thing enough. isn't, uh, isn't Reggie in my name because it makes a difference, right? When you're not footing the bill for, uh, uh, things you break when you drop it and, and dealer <laughs> services, it changes a little bit, your feeling on the bike. So, uh, yeah. disclosure, don't have a desert X. <laughs> okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Well, I'd like, I'd like to take a hard pivot. My first question, it's, um, not that you'd be able to notice because the production quality for high side, low side is so incredibly high, but it is quite early in the morning, um, earlier than we normally record these. And it, um, as I, as I pulled myself out of bed this morning to meet up for this podcast recording, um, I got to wondering, what does Ryan Fortnite eat for breakfast? As I eat my breakfast, I thought, I wonder what, I wonder what he's eating. I wonder what his, his Wheaties are. At the moment, it is nothing but uh, this sherbet mate, uh, which we had an Argentinian guy who worked in our office for a while, who was phenomenal, and we wish he was still here. And he got us all into drinking mate because he maintained that uh, it was the good caffeine, right. which I'm not sure is particularly true. Um, <laughs> but it is lovely. And you, and you can fill a cup with the green stuff and then spend all day just feeding it the water. So you kind of have one level of caffeine that carries you throughout the day. You can have a nice hot drink constantly. Interesting, and, interesting. And not be hopped up on like six uh, monsters like Spurgeon is this morning. Hypothetically, so, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's so, the bad so no, caffeine, guys. So, <laughs> so no no foodstuffs for you yet. We're, we're at 7.30 in the morning here, West Coast time. No, you have had any food just mate just tea totally i got quite excited when what do they call it intermittent fasting became a trendy thing because i've been doing it out of laziness since i was about 18 um i wake up early and just can't be bothered to eat because I, I never feel like eating first thing in the morning gotcha. and then i get busy in work and i work all day and it's often five six by the time i i remember to eat anything um, and at that point of, I haven't eaten for 24 hours, which is not the best. I, I try yeah. to get lunch, uh, when I can. Yeah. That's not really intermittent fasting. That's just sort of like, that's a, that's yeah. a long fast. That's one meal a day you're talking about. Our producer then, Chase is shaking his head in disgust. He eats about every two <laughs> hours. So I think he's very, he's, he's not dealing with this kind of idea very well over here. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I mean, okay. Yeah. Different strokes for different folks. Well, I had you down for a toast and marmalade kind of breakfast, but I, I was obviously way off. I was way off. I was I was thinking donuts and maple syrup, but either way. <laughs> so one, so getting back to the bikes that you do have at this point, you mentioned you know there's a bunch of motorcycles in your garage, you know, around the two thousand dollar mark. One of the reasons um, that we wanted to have you on for this episode in particular is that you've done a bunch of content around uh, electric motorcycles, electric vehicles in general. Um, yeah. But with the video that specifically kind of sparked my interest for bringing you on for this particular episode was the why electric motorcycles are failing and it appears that you you took a uh, uh, old suzuki chassis and you built uh, an electric motorcycle for yourself is that still one of the bikes that you actually have in your garage and that you ride around on and can you speak to our audience a little bit about how that whole project idea came to fruition yeah it is a bike that i still have it's a 1970 suzuki tc90 we filmed a few videos on it at first, we bought that motorcycle to hang on the wall in our studio because we're a motorcycle channel and we didn't want anyone to forget when we go on our long tangents. So we picked up a bike that didn't run and, and presumably had no hope of running for uh, maybe a couple hundred bucks. And it looked cool and we hung it on our wall. And then a while later, uh, we got ambitious and said, hey, let's see if we can make this thing go. So we made it work and shot a video called uh, $400 bike, 400 kilometer adventure or something like that. I think we were $400 deep into the thing at this point because it, it took some parts and that was a lot of fun, but we realized that, uh, it burnt an insane amount of oil and the top end was completely shot. So the next thing we did with it was rip everything out of the motorcycle. We made a video on what all the different parts do. And then we made another video where we uh, swapped it for an electric motor because that seemed quite a bit easier and cheaper um, than making the gas bike good again. So that's how it sits right now. It's got a, what does it have in it? I think it's got a tiny little battery. Um, it was like 1500 bucks, the whole kit all in. And it has the the legal maximum for power to be right. a limited it has a hub, speed motorcycle. It has a hub motor that's like, that's like the most you can use without needing a motorcycle license. Is that right? 
Exactly. I can't remember yeah. what the what the number was, like fifteen hundred kilowatts or something like that. I remember. Um, I thought. I think that's what you said in the video was fifteen hundred kilowatts. Sounds about right to me. Yeah, it'll do like sixty something like that. Sixty seventy Kilo- um, kilometers per hour. Behind you. Yes. Mm. Yes. Metric units. Um, definitely <laughs> not sixty miles an hour. Would be pretty scary if it did. <laughs> it doesn't have a back brake because the um, the hub motor uh, mm. made that impossible. Um, is, so you wouldn't want to ride it very fast. I suppose you could do like a you could do like a um, a quasi like bicycle brake, right? Like a rim, like a rim brake. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. V brake. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's quite a good um, idea. Um, you get you get some power out of those. It, it would yeah, be worth something. It might, might course, be better than nothing. Yeah, no clutch, so you can have your your brake on your, there on your you fingers, which I think is an objectively better way to do it. You get um you get your uh you get some regen from uh, from D cell though with no no rear brake, but you get a little bit of regen on D cell. Is that correct? Totally. Yeah, it's okay. got a little bit of a uh, little bit of regenerative. You can right. toggle it um on the dash set a, a a different level for engine braking, which is pretty cool. So uh, just just as a conversion for our audience, uh, that's roughly between like 37 to 40 miles an hour. Um, I think if I remember correctly in in watching some of your content, you get roughly like 60 kilometers before it the battery's dead. Is that about right? Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. So like it, in theory, um, kind of tying into, you know, what we're going to talk about today, it would be a great little vehicle for around town. You don't presumably need a motorcycle license and you... Uh, oh. I f***ed up. You guys are coming through the main speakers. This is probably going to ruin your audio, right? All right. Back at it now that Ryan has stopped f***ing up the audio. Uh, so his Sorry, words, boys. not ours. So what we're talking, what we're going to pivot to in this episode is, is all kinds of conversation around electric vehicles. Um, but presumably, uh, the, the bike that you built um, with, you know, roughly 35 to 40 miles of range with a top speed of around 35 miles an hour, uh, I'm guessing it's probably a pretty good around town vehicle. If you ride it into your office, you can plug it in, you can then ride it home. So is that about how you use it? Totally. Um, that was the case we made in the video was, hey, this is where electric motorcycles make sense. Because motorcycles have a different problem with highway use than cars do. Because we have big fat torsos that stick up, so we can't be slippery like a Tesla. We haven't got the room to put in two motors, like one geared for the highway and one geared for the city. So you kind of have to pick a middle one, and then it's not that efficient at 100 kilometers an hour. Um, so city use makes a ton of sense. You get the benefits of regen. Your velocity is slow. Resistance goes with velocity squared, so it makes a really big difference for the range you get. And you have this light, small thing that you can pull into your apartment and plug in, which is a massive benefit when you're talking about a daily use vehicle. So yeah, it's about perfect for running to and from work. My commute's 12 minutes, so I can do it, you know, I don't know, yeah. uh, do, six yeah, times do, yeah, or something before yeah, I have to you're charge sitting, it. You're sitting here talking about velocity <laughs> times squared. I'm trying to figure out how to convert 60 kilometers per to miles an hour. You're talking about so. dividing. Our, our <laughs> audience isn't, isn't that mathematically inclined, Ryan. Let's, let's dumb this down a little bit. Scale it back. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so to yeah to, to move on with the discussion, I think aside from uh, Senor Ryan, who has uh, created as as you said in the video, you know, largely the perfect electric motorcycle. It has very few flaws. I think that was the, that was the <laughs> takeaway that that I uh, that I took. Um, it's it's awfully handsome. I think we can agree there. And it's very um, kind. And pretty, pretty functional as well. But probably worth talking about uh, to kick off this discussion uh, in, in, on a grand scale, which what the state of the nation is in, in electric motorcycling right now, like which companies are making motorcycles, right? Just like sort of like a quick rundown so that we're all on the same page. Does that uh, make sense to everybody? Yep. Makes sense. Spurgeon's calved up. He could probably get this done in yeah, about exactly. 20 why don't you seconds say for that, us. Like 1.2x, Spurge. Why don't you just uh, start? reading off companies that have successfully marketed. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I would say a short <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. And true. I think that's something that, that even, you know, Ryan hit on in his video, like so many of these manufacturers just haven't succeeded. And and we can kind of get into some of the nuts and bolts in that a little bit later. I think Zero is the one that automatically comes to mind, along with Livewire. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, for those of you keeping score, um, Harley Davidson did split Livewire off into its own brand. So when we speak of Livewire now, it is technically its own brand of motorcycles. And at the time of this recording, uh, the Del Mar, 
which is supposed to be the next iteration of Livewire, has not been released. I know there were some, rumor, some rumors around a release happening uh, of that motorcycle in France uh, in the end of June or early July or maybe mid-July. But mm. as, of, as of the time of this recording, at the time that this releases, the Del Mar still hasn't been released. So, you know, there's a lot of still development in the ether around that particular bike. Which ones and am I missing? Well, I think I think we should also I should back up a little bit and say when I say uh, you know companies who have successfully brought electric uh, or you know have successfully made electric bikes, I don't want it to define success in the same way that Ryan might define success, which is sort of like a sales success. I think what I meant was successfully put a an electric motorcycle for sale that people can buy. Sure, it made a be, thing that you can sit on. Correct, and you can purchase. And and you have made some points in your videos, Ryan, about how it's it's hard to call it a success when you've only sold a few hundred of them, or they're just just like prohibitively expensive. And those are good points to make. I think um, uh, more what I was reaching for this time around uh, for this part of the discussion was you know the fact that. Uh, that yes, Livewire makes uh, a motorcycle that you can buy and is claiming to make a second one that you can buy, although they have not yet, as Spurgeon said. And then Zero has a, a fleet of electric motorcycles that you can buy. And um, uh, and I mean, it, it goes beyond that as well. I mean, there's um, there's the 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 Stark um, Varg dirt bike, which we, as far as we can tell, is has started to be delivered to people. Um, right. You could also stretch it to. Uh, you know, other company, companies dabbling in other pieces of the electric market, like um, Stasic, uh, you know, Harley Davidson's, that Harley Davidson's associated with Stasic, are they, are they Yeah, they, they own them. Right. So Stasic has, makes these electric kids bikes, um, which is not the same as like a, a full on electric motorcycle, but it's a, I'm gonna, it I'm is gonna, an electric I'm gonna, product. I'm going to stop you for a second, only because like, that's a, like everybody and their mother and brother are making <laughs> electric bicycles and electric tiny two wheel vehicles right now. So like, I, unless you disagree, like we can sit here and talk about like Alta, which is defunct or other motorcycle that have been created. But like, I think if we're going to talk about electric two-wheel transportation, maybe some of the smaller ones should wait until later in the conversation. That's unless fair. You, unless That's you fair. disagree, That's fair. yeah. So in that in that case, let's just uh, give a tip of our cap to um, uh, to companies like uh, well KTM, where you can get a free ride, an electric free ride, right? Um, yeah. And uh, and Ducati, who uh, which does not sell an electric motorcycle, but uh, Ducati has made one, and they will they will be raced as far as everyone can tell on in, on, in a world champion electric world championship, um, and also Triumph, who has made a sort of speed triple derived electric motorcycle that is, again is not for sale yet, but is by all accounts a, a motorcycle that exists and has been ridden. Yeah, have either of you guys ridden an Energica? I have. I have, I have not. No. A, a while ago, and I have not ridden. Uh, it was years ago, and I have not ridden the new Xperia, which is the quote-unquote adventure touring um, uh, version, which has the, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, the largest uh, battery pack, the largest battery capacity of any, of any uh, electric motorcycle for sale today. I believe so, yes. I wanted to bring them up because I hear fantastic things about them. Yeah. They're not available in Canada, so I know very little about the company, and I've never <laughs> ridden the bikes, but uh, people say there may be a step up from zero. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. And I, again, I have not ridden the new Xperia, uh, and I have not ridden a uh, an electric bike, an, an, an Energica model since uh, it's been a few years at least, um, which is fair to point out because these things develop quickly, right? Like especially companies in their sort of nascent stages, they can they For can sure. move along quite quickly. The last time I rode an Energica, it was not as good as a as a late model zero. Interesting. Um, so, in my opinion, anyway, it was it was uh, it, I was underwhelmed. It was quite heavy. Um, it didn't handle all that well. Um, it was it was fast-ish, uh, but uh, but it was also like thirty grand the one that right. I rode. So uh, it was I, I wasn't I wasn't blown away. And it was interesting though because I've had the same feedback. I had someone I recently did a um, a, a daily rider episode on a zero uh, DSRX, the, also the the quote unquote adventure touring. Um, version of a zero, uh, which I, I quite like as a motorcycle. And, uh, someone commented on my social media post and said, have you ridden, like, what about Energica? They're clearly the best, um, you know, electric motorcycle company 
you know, they're clearly making the best bikes. And I, I thought, I wonder where that came from. I don't Are, are people singing their praises uh, elsewhere? Is, is that what you've heard? I've heard the exact same thing as you, Zach, where every time we make a video on electric bike, the comments are full of people saying, hey, why didn't you cover Energy Kit? This is where the real leading edge of electric motorcycles is. Uh, it's interesting to know that you've had the same experience. Yeah. And it's interesting to know that a few years ago you found it to be untrue, which means a lot <laughs> coming from you. You're uh, probably one of the most competent motorcycle reviewers uh, that are out there in terms of riding ability. So uh, fascinating to hear. <laughs> well, like I said, I think it's a little bit unfair for me to judge it. Uh, you know, it's unfair for me to ju to ride a 2023 Zero and have ridden a 2019 or something like that Energica and say, "Wow, it's not as good." Because this is it's not the same as riding a 2019 Yamaha and a 2023 Suzuki or something like that. Like the you know, it's a different it's a different uh, arena they, to play. They in. develop fast. It's it's an, a, a very good point. Have either of you guys followed the TT Zero? Um, over the years, the Isle of Man yeah, electric class. Yeah, Isle of Man electric. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, sort of. When I was at when I was in Isle of Man a few years ago to see the races, I remember seeing uh, the bikes in person, and they're quite, um, they're, they're, really something to see in person because the battery has to be so big. Yeah. To yeah. Go around the course. Um, phenomenally interesting machines, and I, I bring it up because when you look at the gas TT bikes year by year the times are going down, you know, on, on the order of seconds. And then right. when you look at the TTT, uh, zero times, you know, 2014 or something like that, it's like 23 minutes and then it's 22 minutes and then it's 21 minutes and 20 minutes and 19 minutes and 18 minutes. It's like, holy shit, these guys are saving like a right. minute a year. The, the rate of development for electric right. bikes is way, way faster than with gas bikes, which I think reinforces your point about, uh, five-year-old Energica, uh, not being very comparable to a recent zero. Unfortunately, I think there were very few manufacturers competing in TT zero and they recently axed it from the, um, did they from the calendar? I think so. Yeah. I, well, the, 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 as we record this, the Isle of man, uh, has, has concluded recently, I think, mm. or is still happening or something. Um, and I have not seen a lot of coverage of, of that. So that sort of makes sense because usually they're sort of, uh, that's the kind of thing they would be trumpeting. I feel like there's like a, doc there was like a documentary on Netflix, and the, like they were there was they were trying to get a lot of press around that originally. Yeah. Um, All right. But but, it, sp but spinning spinning back to something that I, I'm pretty sure both of you um, and myself included have experience with is Sondors as uh, mm. an electric motorcycle company that is mm, in right. theory uh, <laughs> producing an electric <clears throat> two wheeled vehicle that is. Uh, arguably a motorcycle. Um, <laughs> Some yeah, soft arguably. language there. Zach, I caught, I, I caught your video on the Sondors and instantly felt less bad about mine. Um, yeah, I, th I think, I think you, you took the cake for, uh, for cutting critiques there. Did uh, I? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. I think so. Uh, I don't, I don't, um, I don't remember what I said uh, that was, that was particularly uh, cutting there. But Zach um, oftentimes blanks out after he's he's out there for doing a daily rider or, or doing a video. Yeah, he, just, he goes into this uh, sort of red mist rage and <laughs> just unloads on a bike, doesn't remember the, anything after, revs those yeah, lawyers, yeah. start freaking out and going the, to work. The, the daily rider trance that I go into. I think yeah. the, um, yeah, the, the, the interesting thing about the Sondra's Metacycle, the, now, now that I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm dredging up these memories, is that I feel like at its core, it's so good and so um, so ready to, to take on the world in, in a way that just feels like a lot of times what you find with electric motorcycles, I think, is either the capability or the technology just like isn't there, right? And and you and and whether it's whether it's auto, whether it's electric cars or electric motorcycles, you're like bumping up against this technology ceiling of like, well, we can't charge any faster, we can't put any bigger battery in, we can't do these things. But realistically, for a for a, a, a smallish city urban bike, the technology was there. I thought like the Sondor is like fast enough to be entertaining for me. It's it's small enough to be considered a small motorcycle. It it goes far enough to be considered an urban runabout. I, I didn't have problems with any of that stuff really um it was just the fact that they that that the that sondors as a company had clearly not made a motorcycle before in any capacity 
just the, the sort of like basic stuff that a company like Honda or something like that would have would never have made those mistakes, like a seat that is just horrendous or a, a dash, you know, the display being almost meaningless like none of like the lights just sort of light up in this weird like lego like way that you're like yes. what, is he, what are you even talking about it has uh, a tachometer right yeah kind of kind of it doesn't it's not, it doesn't, it's not a power meter it's just like lights that light up as you accelerate and it's not connected to anything it's just sort of like yay we're moving now totally it's, very, it's a light like, show yeah yeah it's 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 very very strange and those kind of mistakes are 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 both understandable and completely inexcusable if you're going to like market a motorcycle be like we have an electric motorcycle like why would that be like why would all that stuff be so bad and yet the stuff that is often bad about motor- electric motorcycles was not bad it was like pretty pretty okay to use totally and hey kudos to sondors for at least getting the thing made because yeah. we can say hey Honda wouldn't have made these mistakes. It is probably true, but right. where's my electric Grom? Where's yeah. my E Cub? You know, like exactly, they wouldn't 100%. have done it, but they haven't done it. So yeah, and you and know, I think I think that was a message. You. Absolutely, that was a message that I that I that I uh, tried to deliver at the end of that Daily Rider episode. Was like, th- there's there's a massive uh, there's a round of applause that's due just for having done it at all like you said you know like what they've 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 done something that honda and bmw and every other major manufacturer in the world has not bmw has a scooter they do yes you've ridden it zach the c what is it ceo4 ceo4 yeah um yeah and yeah it's it's a it's it's a it does count it is an electric scooter it's an electric motorcycle of sorts um, and it's it's quite good. It's luxurious and 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 fast enough, and good. it's good in many many ways. Uh, but it's also like a bit of a parts bin R and D project kind of thing. You know, they're sort of like, well, we can take these batteries from the auto division and we can like slam them under this little scooter, and then we can. It's a design exercise, and everyone was like, wow, it looks so futuristic and cool. Which I think it does look futuristic and cool. And then when you ride it, it's quite competent and good. And all like, I mean, the dash on that thing is beautiful, and the seat is quite comfortable. It's all the stuff that you'd expect to be good from a company like BMW. Um, but I, I still think that the Sondors deserves a tip of the cap above BMW for something like that because it created a, a, a like new from the ground up, totally you know engineered to be a certain thing electric motorcycle rather than saying like what can we steal from the from the bins around <laughs> around BMW and and like cobble something together and like make this little thing that we could sell to people. Which I think it's two different things. They did and they I, did the Ryan Fort Nine thing on a grander scale, right? They looked around and they were like, "How can we cobble something together?" Totally. Yeah. I mean, mine is absolutely not a serious motorcycle. It's it's not saleable in any sense of the word. Right. Um, right. It's an old '70s uh, chassis with a battery in it. Um, you know, Saunders did uh, significantly better than that, and I would argue that their bike looks really good. Um, possibly Are, even better than the BMW. When when we were around filming with it. I don't think I've had more people want to come and talk about a bike mm. uh, yeah. as I had with that one. Yeah, um, everyone absolutely. sees that big hole where the gas tank could be and goes, "Whoa, that's electric!" and um, and uh, and it's quite striking at Agreed. the cost of your uh, coccyx. Yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> to put it politely. Yes, you, I think the word you used was a little too long, but yeah, it's that yeah. word. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it, it's a. Yeah, exactly right. I think that I think that's it's one of those things, right, where you look at the Saunders and you're like, "Wow, it looks so cool," and then you sit on it and you're like, "Oh, that's why it looks so cool," because, <laughs> yeah. because they didn't think about the shape of a human being sitting on it whatsoever. Totally. Uh, I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's arguably the same problem with uh, a lot of that cafe racer uh, craze, sure. where they basically just put sure. some uh, fabric over top of a two by four and said, "Go <laughs> ride this around." But okay, so. Three motorcyclists get onto a Zoom call and start recording a <laughs> podcast, and we're already just throwing names out of all these different electric bikes that presumably we can all go out and buy. You can walk into a Zero showroom now and buy one. You can walk into a Livewire showroom and buy one. You can place an order to Sondors, uh, send them a check for $7,000, and you know if you're <laughs> lucky someday, you might get something for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if not, there's a way to recoup your loss. Uh, but my point in saying all of that is that there are electric motorcycles on the market now. And, and I want to think about this from a motorcyclist perspective, because as we, as we get a little bit later in the podcast, I think we can talk a little bit more about uh, maybe a non-motorcyclist perspective and how that might be appealing in some ways. But from a motorcyclist perspective, Ryan, guest honors first, 
why aren't electric motorcycles working? What are the hurdles? We, we, we have them, we know them, we've ridden them. Why don't any of us own one, aside of maybe one that we've built from some batteries that we ordered <laughs> from China? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. The uptake has been shockingly slow. We ran the numbers in the UK because they published all the data. And the uptake on e-motorcycles was like 20 times less than it was for e-cars. Right, so right. proportion of, of e-bikes to gas bikes and proportion of, of electric cars to gas cars, it's, it's way, way behind. I think the reason is that we've been building electric bikes that are massive and $40,000 and by and large street bikes. And on the road, you can just slam your wrist and burn through 100 kilowatts in seven minutes. And then everyone goes, this thing sucks. It's not good for anything. But that's not the best use case for an electric motorcycle. As we talked about, small city makes way more sense um, from, a, from an efficiency perspective. And traction limited environments, um, dirt bikes, trials bikes, um, you can only put down at any given time like a few horsepower because that's all the dirt will take. And because electric motorcycles can do traction control six times better than a gas engine, you end up using a whole lot less power, but going just as fast. And so you end up with a much more practical machine. So I think the main reason that, that uh, motorcyclists in general and, and us as three dudes don't own electric bikes is because they haven't been building the ones that make a lot of sense. Hmm. So then that my question for you to kind of piggyback off of that, because um, I, I don't disagree with you, is it that, so I feel like a lot of what you're saying, whether that's too much power on the street or- um, Not so much too much power is just um, any idiot can put it all down at one time and kill the battery. But that, that's my point. It's too much power because it drains the battery. And right. if you're looking in the off-road segment, you're saying yourself, it makes a lot of sense why do I have a KTM 350 in the garage and not uh, used Alta? Because of range. And, and from, you know, if I'm going to go out and do a dual sport ride that's, you know, 85 miles, and the, I think the KT, even like take Alta out of the picture, look at the KTM uh, e bike. I think like at, at, at power, at, at, at throttle, mm -hmm. at full, full whack, you're maybe getting 50 to 60 miles of range with that. So then the range anxiety starts to creep in. Um, so it sounds like, the, we're building bikes that are too big, too powerful, and the battery technology hasn't caught up with that for motorcycles. Would that be accurate or no? To totally. Energy density is, is the big problem everyone talks about, right? If you take a liter of gasoline and a liter of battery, the amount of energy you have in it is, is a shockingly disparate number. To your point, absolutely, your KTM 350, the way you use it, sort of adventure dual sporting, wouldn't make any sense as an electric bike. But if you were riding motocross and you're running 20 minute motos, um, suddenly you have, uh, have a much better case there. The closest I've ever come to actually buying an electric bike is a trials bike. Hmm. They make heaps and heaps of sense on trials. I burn out way before the battery does. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I'll put it, I'll put a controversial, potentially controversial take in here. Um, I think, because you, I don't. I, I think you're onto something when you say that motorcycle companies or companies who are building electric motorcycles are arguably building the wrong product because they're trying to appeal to sensibilities of motorcyclists and 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 ended up end up maybe painting themselves into a corner when they look at who has the ability to buy. Uh, an electric motorcycle with all the technology that's needed and what those people want and so on and so forth. I would argue one, one takeaway that I had from the zero DSRX, um, daily rider that I did recently is that I think that there's a big miss going on in, in like marketing also in, mm. in expectations. I think there's mm. a cultural shift that needs to happen within motorcycling to understand what electric motorcycles can do because all we ever, like you said, someone can just, you can just ride an electric motorcycle and then you can burn out the battery and you can say it only goes hundred miles. Like this thing stinks. I hate it. Mm -hmm. And the, the zero DSRX, for example, is marketed as like a, an adventure bike, you know, it's yeah. like the brochure is all about it being in, in the mountains. And, and I think that's basically, and I like, I, I'm a, I'm a fan of zero. I, I'm like sort of 
almost proud of that company <laughs> for considering how far it's come in the past decade or so. But it's a huge disservice to market that bike as an adventure bike. I, just, I, I feel like I feel like if it was marketed as an urban assault vehicle, you know, if it was like, you know, get around the city as, you know, in silence or like, you know, bomb eat, around. Eat, eat up potholes without worrying about it. Yeah, wh whatever totally. whatever it is. Um, then, then people would be upset that it was so expensive. They would be like 20 grand, 25 grand for a, a city bike. Are you joking? But what they would not be able to complain about is a hundred and a hundred mile range, 110 mile range, like, or yeah, let's just say hundred miles, which is nothing for an adventure touring bike. It's pitiful, but for a city bike, what do you need more than hundred miles for? That's, that's great. And it's like stonking fast. I mean, it does power wheelies. It's got a front trunk for carrying stuff around. It's like upright and commanding riding position. It does all mm. the things that a, a Versa 650 or a Yamaha Tracer 9 or these other kind of quasi adventure bikes that aren't really adventure bikes. The only reason they get away with being called touring bikes is that you can fill up the gas tank in three minutes and you can keep riding and they put saddlebags on it and they say, oh, it's a touring bike. But so mm. many of those bikes are used to just ride around sub or urban or suburban environments and they're so good at it. And that's one of the reasons that people like it so much. Ryan, so if we just Ryan, called uh, Ryan, you need to understand that one of the things Zach is very passionate about in motorcycling <laughs> is the frunk. So if you he put loves a, the if frunk. You, yeah, if you put a frunk on a motorcycle, Zach's going to sit here and sing its praises for at least five minutes. Conti I, continue, Zach. Keep going. I, I kind of get it. Had an NC750 recently, and I, I, I was brought round to the frunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, the I, where I was going with that, obviously. Thank you for <clears throat> for for bringing my bringing my rant under control, Spurge. Is that I think that I, I'm often frustrated with sometimes myself, but especially the general public in motorcycling for 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 being disappointed or or upset about what an electric bike can do because of the way that it was presented, you know, like, because, oh, well, this, this, this thing is supposed to be this. Well, and if it's, if it's an adventure touring bike, then like there aren't any outlets in the mountains, LOL, what is this piece of crap? But if you just like look at it through a different lens, then all of a sudden, yeah, it's expensive and yeah, it's heavy, but that's kind of where the complaints end. It's a great point. I think I saw a picture of that zero on the crest of some uh, cliff looked like maybe somewhere in Utah or something. Right. And I just thought they're asking for people to shit on them. Yeah. Like, this is this is the worst possible photo you could take that bike because <laughs> anyone with an IQ level of 4 will be able to say, "Oh, there's no chargers in the mountains." <laughs> and and suddenly you have a, a a bad marketing image. So Yeah. So um I think I think we it, it does um it does deserve some mention. We did run a um an article uh, on Common Tread at some point, or no, excuse me, it was, it was a Common Tread Journal magazine article um, from our, uh, our friend Tucker at Electric Cycle Rider, um, which is a fun uh, YouTube channel and website if you haven't seen it. Um, he did he did a backcountry, I think he did a thousand mile backcountry discovery route, is that right Spurgeon? Yep. On mm. uh, zero DS, uh, like zero dual sport. Um, and you know, it was obviously an exercise. Like the, the point was you can do this if you want to. And certainly sure. the story was, was rife with range, range anxiety <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's, you know, you're building the whole trip around like, ah, can I get to that thing and can we charge up and will it work? Um, which in some ways is not totally dissimilar from a dual sport ride where you'd need to find, pick your way through the mountains and find gas along the way. But uh, it certainly, it was a big piece of the narrative was like finding electricity to fill up the bike. But the point is, you can do it. It is possible. And, and, and we're getting to that point where I think, uh, you know, seeing an electric bike that's, that's quote unquote designed to go into the mountains or designed to go on an adventure. It's not that it cannot be done. It's that it, like you said, Ryan, it's such low hanging fruit for criticism, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and would you want to do it? I've heard that the most recent iteration of the long way up where they did yeah. it on the live wires. Yeah basically devolved into that. It was not so much about this adventure, but ooh, we're going to try this adventure on electric bikes. And the whole thing was a, an exercise in maximizing range and, and overcoming range anxiety. I don't know if this is true. I haven't seen it, but <laughs> it sounds a lot like what you were talking about with, um, with the gentleman who wrote that article. Yeah. It's fun to go on an adventure. It's possible to go on an adventure where the main narrative and motivator is, can we do it with this much charge? But is that 
enjoyable anymore? Right. Is, would it, would yeah. it be better to yeah. just enjoy the BDR and not have to think <laughs> about it? So that or gets not back, have to think about it nearly as much, at least. Sure. Yeah. And, that, and that gets back to, to what kicked off this conversation around, like, what are some of the current hurdles around electric yeah, motorcycles? Yeah, what are we talking and, about again, Spurge? Bring us back, yeah, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Get us on track here. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to do it in a very organic sense. So, like, Ryan kicked <laughs> off this portion of the conversation around the fact that, you know, the battery capacity just hasn't kept up. And, and then, you know, Zach talked about, you know, zero marketing this adventure bike. And I think the biggest problem that I see with electric motorcycles and those who manufacture them is they are trying to market them to motorcyclists. And anybody that's already a motorcyclist is going to say, I can go buy a used SV650 and get more performance for less money. Why would I go buy this? I think they're missing the target. And I think this is where Sondors, because you know when we originally talked to Sondors, they didn't even want to let us borrow a motorcycle. They didn't want to market the Sondors to motorcyclists. They wanted it to go to completely four-wheeled individuals that had never ridden two wheels before. And I am reminded of the first time that I took a Super 73 home at Christmas and my brothers got on one. And my, my middle brother, who has never ridden a motorcycle, never been interested, absolutely fell in love with it. He's a high school teacher. He's like, my, my high school is, is six miles from my house. I want one of these. It would be so much fun to ride this to school in the morning, to ride this home. I would like this so much more than my car. And that's you know a $3,000 pedal bike that has a thumb throttle that goes 20 miles an hour. And he was over the moon for it. He's not talking about the fact that it's not powerful enough. He's not talking about the fact that it only gets 20 miles. He's not talking about the fact that it's $3,000 for a vehicle when I could buy a used SV650 for that kind of money. <laughs> he was just enamored by it. And so I think one of the biggest hurdles in electric motorcycles today is the fact that these manufacturers can't get out of the, their own way from thinking about things as if it was still 20 years ago and everybody wants a motorcycle and everybody wants more aggression and more power and more speed. You look at the demographic of riders that's coming up now, you look at the average, you know, 18 to 25 year old, they, they don't have excess money to spend and they're not looking for something that's aggressive and high speed and dangerous. They're looking for something much more modest. If that, most of them are just paying for Lyft or Uber to, to get around the city. <laughs> right. So I think this, it's, they're, they're not marketing these correctly. This, this reminds me also of uh, a conversation I had with someone at Honda where they, they were talking about going to, um, uh, you know, talking about going to motorcycle shows or uh, trade shows or sort of like, you know, setting up pop-ups in places where they can interact with the public. Right. And, um, and there was some, I forget if it was like a, it was like some sort of um, high school job fair or a job fair expo or something like that, you know, where there's a bunch of uh, high school and college students like looking for internships and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, and the guy at Honda was saying, it's interesting, we bring, you know, we bring a lot of the um, the sort of what Honda calls mini moto uh, uh, product line there, right? So Honda Grom, Honda Monkey, uh, Super Cub, um, Trail 125, that kind of thing. Um, and they said that it's interesting when you're, when when you hang around with people who are young and not motorcyclists, nobody asked them how much horsepower it had. No, not a single person said how, like, how much power does it have or like what kind of brakes does it have or anything like that. The questions were all, how fast can it go? And if once they learned it could go 55, they were like, wow, that might as well be the speed of light. And the other question was how much, what, how many miles per gallon does it get? What, like, what kind of, what kind of MPG is, you know, when you, and we tell them the Honda guy was like, when you say a Grom can get a hundred miles to the gallon or whatever, you know, then, then some high school kid who's driving a, a, an O3 Honda Accord that's getting 30 is all of a sudden like, whoa, a hundred miles to the gallon. No way. And, and that, like you said, Spurge, that's a totally different viewpoint, right? Yeah. It's a great, great way to look at it. Um, cause electric motorcycles do a thing that is kind of in between what an e-bicycle can do and what a motorcycle can do. That's sort of where their their capabilities sit. And so as a business, you have to decide, okay, do we want to try to market the motorcyclists into sort of stepping down into the capabilities of an electric motorcycle, or would we rather market the uh, electric bicyclists into stepping up into the capabilities of an electric motorcycle? And obviously it's an easier sell to get <laughs> people um, to, to step up, not to mention that you're dealing with a, a massively larger sample size. Motorcyclists in Canada, I think, are like, 
don't know, two, 3% of the population or something like that. Yeah. The amount of people who have an e-bike is, is 20 or 30 times bigger. Fantastically um, more and, than that. And, and just ballooning. Yeah. So it, it, it makes a lot more sense and they don't have the preconceived notions. Like we're the dinosaurs who think that, um, a two wheeled vehicle should smell like gas and leak toxic oil <laughs> everywhere right. and, and go burr, you know, but it doesn't have to be that way. Like we're all on computers right now. If our computers smelled like gas and leaked oil on our desks and went burr, the whole time we were using them, we'd be I like, this it. is terrible. I love it. This is amazing. It's, yeah. <laughs> it'd be better if they're silent and clean and you know, like that's, that's the obvious way if you're starting from first principles to build a computer. And I think first principles to a motorcycle is the same, like objectively, it would be better if they were silent and clean and didn't stink. If we didn't have the, our, our own habituated loves of all things gasoline. But right. And like memories don't of our uncle loves. and so on and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, we can, we can go at, at a, at a target group that doesn't have those notions and, and it's an easier sell. Yeah. The biggest thing I, I think that's, that's ruining our wonderful opportunity to get so many more people into motorcycling through e-bikes is the loopholes that exist around electric bicycles because mm -hmm. I can get an electric bicycle that does 60 and is cheaper and goes in my apartment and it doesn't need a license or registration or insurance. So why should I actually become a motorcyclist? Yeah, I think yeah. that's a great well, point. And I, and I think it's going to well, be really I, interesting to see how that changes. We're seeing it with like mountain bike trails already, like where they're putting like the no e-bike signs up because they don't want mm, these right. e-bikes blasting through at 60 miles an hour while there's also people trying to hike and do other things. So I, I think I think you, you talk about the loopholes is a good point. So before before we pivot too hard toward electric bicycles, I want to get to that later. That's obviously a topic of conversation while we're on the on this in this sort of um, uh, this this section talking about hurdles of electric motorcycles. I think talking about price specifically is mm. uh, is only fair. And I think in some ways it includes electric bicycles. Um, and I guess I, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to put it to you, Ryan, if it's not putting you on the spot too much, why are electric motorcycles so expensive? Do you think? And I guess, are, are, is there any connection to why electric bicycles are also so fantastically expensive? I mean, bicycles mm. that are not electric can be quite expensive too, to be clear. So it's not, it's not, you know, you're not going, um, this is a different dynamic in some ways, but I think there are some, there are some tie-ins there, right? Totally. I think when I built the little electric commuter that I have, the most expensive mm -hmm. thing was the battery. I could get the battery for 1100 bucks, or I could get the whole kit, the battery and the motor and the dash and, and the, uh, switch gears and, and the throttle and stuff for 1500. And I think to some extent, the manufacturers of electric motorcycles are dealing with the same problem where their most expensive part is the energy density. And then they're left with very little to make the rest of the motorcycle, meaning they have very thin margins to earn any money if they're going to compete with gas bikes. On a gas bike, how expensive is the fuel tank for Honda to make? Right. Almost you know, nothing. Like 1% like yeah. of the budget, it's sheet metal. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's up to us to buy the gas. They don't, they don't even have to think about it. Everything is just drivetrain and, and power delivery and chassis and brakes and everything else gets to be really nice. Right. And then they can, they can charge, you know, uh, what's a Navi in the States, like 1999 yeah. or something. Two, two grand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amazing. Right. Um, to, to make an electric Navi, you'd be, you'd be that deep into it just on the battery before you built anything else, um, right. on the motorcycle. <laughs> And if you, and smaller volume too, like economies right. of scale, yeah. zero totally. is not putting out anywhere near the, um, the numbers of bikes that Honda is, um, right. shared platforms make a lot of sense, right? Like that e Grom or e cub, um, might be, might be a good way to hack it if they've already done the R and D and, and, and built the chassis and they can swap in right. uh, a battery and electric motor. I don't know. What do right. you guys think? I, I think it's interesting that we keep coming around to batteries. So price batteries range batteries um weight <laughs> batteries and and really like as we're thinking about the biggest hurdle of electric motorcycles and i do want to pivot into some of the areas where it's shining because i think uh ryan yeah. actually gave us a pretty nice tra transition uh, a few minutes ago but the the biggest hurdle if we had to pick ultimately the biggest hurdle is battery technology right. where are you going to charge it what's the range why is it so expensive and it's economies of scale like ryan said where it's like 
there's just we're not building enough of these that it makes sense. And batteries are also expensive because you're competing with with especially when you're talking about like lithium mines and the environmental impact there and all that jazz. Like everything has a has a battery in it these days. So like it's it, you're you're competing against all these other areas which are selling many many more than right. what electric bikes are. I yeah, I think I think that's a I think that's a good way to distill it, Spurge. Uh, the the energy density issue that Ryan brought up before is kind of at the at the root of all that stuff, right? Like you talked about price and weight and range, which all has to do with the battery, which all has to do with trying to sl cram in as much potential energy as you can into mm. this thing to propel you down the road and it just isn't as dense. It just isn't as rich, right? And yeah. Totally. And there are models, I think, where you, in a way, buy the bike and lease the battery. Yeah, like uh, yeah, yeah, overseas. Yeah. Um, Gogoro? Is it Gogoro? Gogoro, yeah. yeah. Um, I never know how to pronounce it, but NIU, NIU, NUI, it's, it's an electric yeah. scooter um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. company. They have swappable models, I think, where... where yes. Um, you're sort of sharing the cost of the battery amongst um, the population at large, and you can go to a, 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 a center and, and pull out a yeah. charge battery and, and stick in a dead one, kind of thing. Yeah, that's a, it's it's sort of the it's the um, propane the, the propane the gas the barbecue tank. propane yeah. tank model, right? right? Yeah. Where, you, where when it's out, you just take it over to the gas station, and you give them twenty bucks, and they give you a new tank. And um, yeah, I, did, I wrote a small article. Uh, for Common Tread uh, about this happening in Nairobi. There's a couple of startups mm. that are doing, they're, they're trying to, there's a lot of like motorcycle taxis in Nairobi. Um, mm. uh, and so the electric thing can kind of make sense if you build the infrastructure along with putting the bikes for sale. And it's kind of like you can buy a bike for fairly cheap because you're not buying the battery. And then you just go and swap out the battery. And every time you need a battery, you just go to the place and you, you mm. give them a few bucks and you take a new one and you never actually own the battery, which I think ultimately is putting the onus and the financial burden on the, someone, you know, it's instead of, instead of spreading out the, the financial burden across many owners who have to pay a premium for having a, a, this battery that they now own, it's putting all of the burden on, on either the, you know, society, like, you know, either, either mm -hmm. the municipal, um, segment that, that put this forth or some some startup or private company that's that's trying to do it it's noble it's interesting it's cool but it, but it's gonna it go come home to roost at some point right for sure one of the things i love about the uh stasics is that they use drill batteries right and and every dad has a bunch anyway um <laughs> which is which is pretty cool not that yeah. i'm theorizing an electric motorcycle where you click on like 50 <laughs> drill batteries but, 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 and but, it's, but, but, but it's the same concept it's the same concept. When I have, I have a Stasic for my nephews and we have a couple of them that are charged up and he'll wear himself out on one and we bring him back in, we swap it out and he you know, continues to go out and go around in circles in the backyard. So like it, the concept that we're talking about isn't that foreign. It's not like there's not being done. We just need to figure out how to make it work in a much larger scale. So that's, right, right, right. that's I think the, um, the Stasic model would be brilliant for motorcycles. Drill batteries obviously can power a two year olds. Right. Uh, bicycle but what else do we use that could also power a motorcycle like is it theoretically possible to have an electric lawnmower that shares batteries with your motorcycle uh, i don't know some type of home power system that shares batteries with your motorcycle a car oh. that shares batteries yeah. with your motorcycle that's what i was going to say a car right like like companies that make both like honda or bmw that make both cars mm. and motorcycles is that you know I, and i think if the motorcycle um well, a lot of things would be different if the motorcycle population and motorcycle market were a lot larger. Mm. But one of the things that would be interesting would be that certainly, or not certainly, I think it's easy to theorize that those companies would be, would be thinking about that, would be putting forth some effort to, to cross pollinate, <laughs> to, to like, can, can you just pull, can you just pull a, a, um, you know, can you pull a drawer out of the bottom of your, of your BMW i3 or your, your three series or whatever and slide it into your scooter yeah and then you know bop around and then and then when you're done with it you can you can slide it out and put it back in your car which plugs into your house or vice versa you know it all sort of connects. totally and it didn't all be modular like the battery in your um in your car could be 70 percent sort of uh, permanent and it could have you know maybe eight true. slots for cartridges true, true, true. on the side yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. you can feed one to your motorcycle or, or you can use it if you're 
using your car and running out of range, you could stop in one of these kind of transfer stations and just swap the eight, which right. gets you, you know, 30% more. Or if you run out on the highway, the tow truck driver can come with, you know, he's <laughs> right. got a bed full Triple of these things a. and suddenly yeah, yeah. give you 30% more range. In, like, in his diesel F-350. <laughs> probably, um, yes. So, <laughs> yeah. or, you could, or you could just like run, you could find an electric motorcyclist and you could just run them off the road and then take the battery <laughs> out of their motorcycle and then put it totally. in your car and you're all good right, to go. All right, yeah. you're getting, we're that getting, actually, now we're going Mad Max and violence. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not a... Uh, not a bad point by any stretch because the batteries are so expensive. And so if they're modular, how do you realistically stop people from stealing them? Like in Vancouver, it's become a big problem for people having their catalytic converters ripped out of the bottom of their cars mm. because, must, because, must, the, but, but we because all the materials know that, are expensive. No, we know that Canadians are too nice for that. You must have a problem with American immigrants yeah, there coming Americans up there coming and that? stealing that's, your catalytic converter. Yeah, that's, I think that's exactly what it is. It's the Washingtonians <laughs> yeah, who are those, coming up. It's all those people from Seattle. Just, just Exactly. Right you can yeah. hear them three in the morning. You hear these clang, clang, clang down the streets yeah. as they're all making it back for the border. They're blasting yeah. Nirvana and Alice in Chains just live in the dream yeah right totally. all, those, all those seattleites waddling down your streets in their birkenstocks with their nose rings being like let's steal the catalytic converters all right that's, now that we've completely uh, isolated seattle as a listening population we've gone <laughs> completely off the rails and i'm rarely the one to bring us back onto the rails but you two knuckleheads have gone completely out of control so that's true Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a pause for a word from our sponsor, Motul, and then we're going to come back to what Ryan was talking about with our computers. Our computers aren't dumping oil and burning gasoline and smelling like shit, and we're okay with that because they're computers. So we're, you know, we're talking about all these hurdles that electric motorcycles have to jump over. Why? Why do we need electric motorcycles? What are electric motorcycles doing right that, hmm. that you know, internal combustion engines aren't? We're going to get into that part of the discussion as soon as we get into word from our sponsor, Motul. All right, everybody, we are back. We, uh, Ryan and I have s uh, successfully <laughs> curbed um, Spurgeon's caffeine high. Uh, he's, ha he's had to rein in our, our, um, our wild rants about electric bikes. I appreciate you doing that, Spurge. And to keep things on track, we should talk about um, uh, the things that electric motorcycles are doing right because there are plenty of things practically that they're doing right and also there are plenty of reasons that um that the world at large keeps reaching for electric vehicles so i think and, that's and worth just so about. and just so our audience realizes um what what we are trying to do here is ryan you know is a very popular person we only have him for about 20 more minutes and we want to make true. sure we can play the engine sound guessing game with him because he's <laughs> never played it that's so, the only reason i'm here to be honest i, I know play. We, we we called him to get him onto the podcast he's like guys, I'll come on to the podcast, but only because I want to play the engine sound guessing game. So the rest of this is just, you know, sugar on the, on the cake. Um, Necessary evil. So electric <laughs> motorcycles, what are they doing right? And I think we can, in the order, in, in, in an effort to save time, what are electric motorcycles doing right? What are electric bicycles doing right? What are, what, what are the good that these vehicles are bringing to the market in 2023? Ryan, guess honors. Indeed. Thank you very much. I think we've already talked about how silent, clean, uh, largely fluidless is probably an objectively better way uh, to make a vehicle if we didn't have our preconceived notions of what a motorcycle should be. So there's that. Way, way fewer moving parts. In theory, your, your mechanic bills or mechanic jobs could be a lot smaller. From a performance perspective, and this is probably the thing that interests me most about electric motorcycles is you can make that power delivery whatever you want. So I've got five gas bikes sitting downstairs because I wanted a two-stroke and I wanted a screamer um, and I wanted a V-twin and all these things are very enjoyable to ride. With an electric bike, it could feel like any of those. You can change the power delivery to be anything. We're used to a world where you have to, back in the day, pull out a carburetor, grind the needle, change the float height, change the jets, and then you'd put it back in and then, ah, shit, everything's worse. And now I've got to do something <laughs> with the air box. And now, now the exhaust isn't flowing well enough. And it was all this weird kind of black magic that took a lot of time and energy. Whereas with an electric bike, you can go in there and like, oh, I want to ride a, a freaking 500 CC two stroke today, load that up. No, now I feel like a, a big V twin, load that up. I want a big bang. Maybe that's going to get me, you know, more traction at this particular racetrack. I can load that up. The motor can do whatever you want. If it's a three pole motor, you have, uh, you know, six times the opportunity to, to change the power delivery per uh, two crankshaft revolutions versus a, versus a gas bike. So 
um, the performance uh, benefits could be massive. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, what, I, what did I, I miss? No, no. no I, think I, think, every, I think everything you're saying, think about it, but not about performance benefits. Think hmm. about it as performance simplicity. Because I'm still going to come back to the biggest area where electric motorcycles or bicycles are shining is that you can take somebody that's never ridden a motorcycle. Maybe they've ridden a bicycle. You can put them on this and they can learn how to do it pretty much on their own. And it's not having to figure out how to do a clutch and shift gears and balance mm. and, and come on the throttle at a certain point while also feathering the clutch if you're off road. Um, and even when I was looking at the most recent, and, and they don't do them anymore, but the IMS shows, the International Motorcycle Shows, um, the, the, the last couple times they were running zeros inside because they didn't pollute and they were training people how to ride on a large carpeted track. The carpet gave mm. them traction um, with the tires and they had, uh, they were able to like your point, they were able to knock down the power uh, performance to you know maximum of like 12 miles an hour. And they had people that had never ridden a motorcycle before zipping around in circles, having a great time. So for me, mm. I think the biggest advantage of where electric potential is shining is bringing more people onto two wheels. I don't give a shit that it's not an internal combustion engine. You're creating interest for people to be on two wheels. And to me, that's that's the biggest advantage here. Zach, I'm sorry. I, I feel like you were trying to say something and I just ran you over. No, no, no. That's that's a, that's a, a, a sort of an alternate take or the other, other side of the same coin or whatever <laughs> uh, phrasing you want to use. And I think that, I think that, that makes sense. Um, and I agree. I think you could, you know, take it, you could keep talking about that, right? Like you can all of a sudden have a little motocross track in your backyard in the suburbs and your kid can come home from school and just and like rip around and, and do a 20 minute moto right next to someone having a barbecue. And all they're going to hear is a, a knobby tire digging at some turf and a, a chain spinning around some sprockets. And it's not going to be disruptive, which hmm. I, I like the idea of that. <laughs> I, I ultimately, I think that's cool. Um, I think what the only thing I was going to say before Spurge is, is, um, is I guess to step back even more than that from what electric bikes do that is good. I guess, why do you guys think what's the big draw to electric vehicles in general? Like the, the, it, it's, it's pollution, right? So, so there's, there's something to be said for the fact that that you can get electricity from renewable sources and then you can plug that elect you can push that electricity into a battery and then you can and then you can use that electricity to get around and then and then re and then repeat <laughs> lather rinse repeat and 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 I think that that's sort that's what that's what society and and yes disposing of batteries is a pain and we're not sure if there's enough lithium in the world and there mm. are there are the other challenges there, yes, but is that not the the main reason, the main driver for why the world is moving toward electric appliances and electric cars and and electricity in general, as I, opposed to fossil fuels? I think, I think that's part of it. And, and but I just want to bring it back around to one thing that you just said, and then I'm going to toss it to Ryan. I think that's part of it. But think about the potential for fun in non-conventional places we're losing our our land people are, are fighting you know especially here on the east coast to to get motorcycles out of public space and to not allow dirt bikes but i read an interesting article a couple of years ago about indoor motocross track parks popping up in europe for electric bikes so mm, small right. little parks inside of a city center where people can just go and ride in the winter mm. in the summer and and they don't have to worry about breathing in toxic fumes so I'm thinking about your kids in a backyard while there's a barbecue going on next door. I'm thinking about uh, not having to drive three hours to get to a forest to ride a dirt bike. I can just go down into a little arena in the city and that's where I can go. Like to me, environmental is what's going to move the masses there. But as a, as a motorcycle enthusiast, there's a lot of other additional things that could happen. Sorry, hmm. Ryan, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> to be contrarian, um, I have... Uh, quite an anonymous friend at Alta who I posed this question to. And my thinking was exactly your guys's. Uh, it's clean um, and it's silent 
And, and so the main motivators for buying an Alta are going to be the a green conscious person or someone who wants to ride motocross um, next to a city. And he couldn't have disagreed more. Um, he was saying, uh, if we're tra talking about selling motorcyclists on electric bikes, motorcyclists by and large don't give a shit about pollution. We ride uh, gas machines for pleasure in North America. If we cared about pollution, we wouldn't be in this hobby to begin with. Fair. Obviously, there's variance there. We care about pollution a little bit, but generally speaking, it's not a, a strong enough motivator to make someone buy an electric bike just on the pollution argument, if we're talking about motorcyclists as our, um, as our sample. He also wasn't that keen on the um, noise argument because motocross tracks, to afford their existence, typically have to be running bikes a lot. And how soon are we going to get to a stage where we can have only electric bikes supporting a motocross track. We're probably talking about something that's maybe decades in the future because there's still 99% of, of the motocross in public. Um, so his take on it was that to sell electric motorcycles to motorcyclists, they have to be faster. Um, they have to just be a better performance proposition because as a recreational user base, that's the, the main thing that, uh, that we're after. But he thought that, that electric bikes uh, were a strong enough performance proposition that it could work. And I think I agree. I was quite a bit faster on the Alta than I was on, on gas bikes, just because I'm kind of shit at motocross and I'm <laughs> constantly in the wrong gear going into a berm. And on that bike, you're, you're always in the right one. And then having your rear brake on, on four fingers rather than, or two fingers rather than a big old meaty foot is, is, <laughs> is far better for, uh, for tractability. It was the same in trials, like uh, I rode uh, a full uh, day trials, half on electric bike and half on the gas one, and I was way better on the electric bike. And I know how to use a clutch of gears, but not having to and not having to think about it just let me focus on everything else and, um, and ultimately made me a, a much better trials rider. Not to mention that uh, you don't exhaust yourself by stalling and then trying to kick it over while <laughs> keeping your feet on the pegs, which is uh, nigh on impossible, I would think, if, if I hadn't seen better guys do it. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's my contrary opinion. No, I think, well, I, but it, it's, I, it speaks back to what we were talking about, because all of that performance that allowed you to be faster as a motorcyclist is also the simplicity that allows it to be easier for non-motorcyclists to get into this. I don't think they're Absolutely. as worried about speed, but they are all that simplicity that you're talking about makes it easier for people to try this out. Yes, easier, faster, uh, I think are, are, are great sales points. And noise, I think, will be one day. Pollution, perhaps, will be one day. Um, but, uh, but I think motorcyclists don't care enough. We care, but we don't yeah. care enough. Do you think I, when, you, when you're going out for a weekend on your KTM, like, ah, uh, this is gonna be bad for the environment? No, I or don't. Do, do you I, just go bomb on a Saturday because that's what you want to do? I, I, I think there's so I I don't worry about the impact that my little motorcycle is having on the environment in the air. I am very um, conscientious around not just blowing through illegal trails and things like that. So right. I, I think there's an aspect there, and I think that what you know where Zach is in Southern California, and even to the extent some of the problems that we're having with tracks on the East Coast. The, the, I would say one of the larger reasons that motocross tracks are being shut down is because urban sprawl, uh, motocross tracks were created 30 or 40 years ago in areas of the country where they were out in the middle of nowhere. Well, now yeah. all of a sudden, populations have pushed out and housing developments are butting up against motocross tracks and they're being shut down because, you know, Johnny and Susie, who just bought their first home, don't want, you know, to hear two-stroke Johnny you know, ripping around a, a motocross track. I'm just throwing <laughs> is, random Is this names the out. same Johnny that's married no, to Susie no, no. who Johnny goes and annoys Johnny his own and wife? This is, this is, no, it's, it's evil twin brother. They, his parents <laughs> gotcha. just named them the same. John, um, Johnny. That's cruel. I know. I think, I think, uh, I think you're right. I, I think that there's some, there's some, there's some validity to, to your, to your anonymous source saying all those things, uh, at all. Cause I don't, um, you know, like, my our, our family car gets almost as good mileage as most bikes that I ride around mm. and it's you know much more comfortable and so like I'm not I'm not actually like riding a motorcycle to work isn't like really saving a lot of gas most of the time unless I'm riding sure. something that's wildly efficient or something like that um so I think that that's fair I think that the the um the yeah I think my point was that society at large 
has this notion, right? That like the, mm. the, that like the whole the whole moving away from fossil fuel thing, the whole like I don't know, you know, less noise pollution, less air pollution kind of thing. But but I think that it's very fair, especially in this mar- in the in the motorcycle market, to say uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter enough for that to be the thing. And I'd like to use that point to pivot to or not pivot, but but reinforce a, a point that um, that you made, Ryan, which is I would like to point out if we're going to talk about things that electric bikes are doing well. I would like to be very clear that some electric motorcycles are just good at being motorcycles. You mentioned mm. the Alta. You did that whole video on the Alta and how uh, you know its demise was not fair because it was actually a very good bike. And um, and I I think that that it was, was a great bike. Yeah, and and uh, and and yeah, and and a a, a, a good a good video, a good, a good look at why things happen and how we don't always understand. And, um, but I think th- there are bikes not like, so to go back to that zero DSR X, um, mm. that I, that I rode most, this most recent electric bike that I rode also probably the best electric bike that I've ridden. And one thing, um, Ari wrote a little op-ed for common tread about that bike and his takeaway was sort of, I remember riding zeros and thinking this is sort of like a glorified mountain bike. Not really mm. like, but just the suspension isn't good. The brakes aren't good. Yeah. The dash yeah. isn't good. Nothing's good. It doesn't, they don't know what they're doing. It's not, the, the company is in, in over its head from, from, a, from, a, from a sort of like ergonomic design standpoint. It's not really working. That's not the case anymore. The, when I say that I liked the Zero DSRX, I didn't just like it as an electric bike. It wasn't like, mm. oh, it's fine for what it is. It, it competes in this very small pool. It's a good motorcycle. The brakes are sharp. It's fast it handles really well. It's comfortable. It has heated grips. It has cruise control. It has like, it has all the things that a motorcycle should have. I mean, if you just sort of square it off against other bikes in the shop, in fact, Ari said this about, uh, when he was riding it, we had a Kawasaki Z650 RS in, around at the time, um, and a Suzuki GSX 8S. So two sort of like mid-sized naked bikes, punchy, fun, good looking uh, to one degree or another <laughs> motorcycles. And Aries just reached for the key to the zero. He's like, I like it. I like the frunk. I like the wind protection. I like the awesome. power. It's fast. You guys it's like, your damn it, frunks. Oh. The point <laughs> is the, the, whether or not Airy appreciates his rice not tipping over in the Tupperware because it's in his backpack is neither here nor there. The point is it is a functionally impressive, engaging, fun, good motorcycle to use, which okay. I think is only fair to point out in this, in the sphere of electric bikes. Doing totally. Things right. I so. suspect that the, the live wire S2 Del Mar will also be very good. Um, and the and regular, version, the you live maybe, wire one is good to be, the to live be wire fair. one is good. Um, yep. the, the Del Mar is, um, allegedly, um, very much Alta's uh, Series B bike. Right, right. Yeah. Um, the yeah. Alta ST. And you mentioned that, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, may, it may be very interesting to ride. Okay. I'm just we, trying to get you out of here on time, Ryan, because you I gave know, us no, you, a cutoff. So I am. I am <laughs> yeah, just, I want to play have, my game. I have producer Chase over here waving his arms. So this is not coming. <laughs> so when the audience is like, Spurgeon's always trying to keep things on track, he just doesn't let Ryan talk. That's Spurgeon's not me, the guys. Worst. There's a producer right here. His name is Chase. You never see him. We're not making him up. Um, so we have I've seen five. Him. <laughs> I've seen him. It's, it's like Bigfoot. Um, yeah. <laughs> we have five minutes left. So in closing, 30 seconds each, and and what you're already talking about kind of wraps this up, but I want to get to the engine sound guessing game, but I also want to close out this conversation. Will electric motorcycles ever be the dominant form of transportation in North America within the motorcycling sphere? Ryan? Absolutely. I have zero doubt. Wow. Zach? That was not even 30 seconds. Uh, Oh, I didn't even know I had 30 seconds. (laughs) I'll I'll take three. I I don't share... um, Ryan's confidence. I, ha- I have a more pessimistic view, which I don't want, but I can't help but bring up, which is that there, there will be some amount of attrition in the motorcycling world because electric grows so quickly. So yes, maybe to Ryan's point, yes, mm. electric will be the dominant force, but what the, the collateral damage there will be that there will be far fewer motorcyclists because people just won't care and they, it won't matter anymore. Interesting. I should qualify as well that I think, um, electric will undoubtedly be the, um, be the dominant, uh, uh, type of power, but I don't think batteries are going to be the storage, uh, solution. Whoa. Um, I know I just opened a whole can of worms with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> four minutes left. Um, 
I'm a big believer in the energy density of hydrogen, um, and I think that's uh, that's a, a very clean way to make as much electricity as you need. And um, uh, anyway, we uh, we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to do another podcast, guys. Hydrogen, I feel like we got you might another, say, is a whole other podcast. Yeah. Everybody, we we'll yeah. have to have Ryan back on to talk about that. So we have, we have Ryan, another two hours here. I should also say that I don't think this is gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> that me and Zach are making like a 80 year bet here, and when we're both 110, <laughs> uh, we can call each other and see who's got to pay up on on right. whether electric bikes. Right, right. Uh, no, uh, in the in the on. last episode of the podcast, we talked about the fact that there was a news release from the big four in Japan that they yeah. are investing together to look into hydrogen technology in small capacity vehicles. So they're basically, right. you have you have the big four that are coming together and saying, we think that hydrogen is gonna be the future, maybe not electric vehicles as we currently know them. And they're looking at studies for not just creating an electric or a hydrogen vehicle, but also storage and transportation of hydrogen and, and, and that piece. But again, a whole other podcast, to wrap this up as we get in the engine sound guessing game, um, I, I'm somewhere between Zach and Ryan. I think that uh, it's probably going to be 20 years uh, before we see electric bikes taking over what we're thinking about as, as motorcycles. I think what's far more likely to happen is that motorcycles just become in, insignificant. Uh, in future generations. I think our generation still has a fondness for it from seeing what our grandfathers and our mothers and our you know, people before us have done. Um, I, I just don't think motorcycling will exist in, in 20 years the way that we know it today. Um, That's and I such think, a sad outlook, Spurgeon. I if, think if we get made redundant by um, goofballs on one wheels, I'm going to retire. Like that's, uh, <laughs> I don't think you're gonna. I, th I think by that together. point, yeah, we'll we'll be we'll be past retirement age. We'll probably be dead. <laughs> um, so, all right, let's move on to the engine sound guessing game. We've got a little under five minutes left with Ryan. Ryan, just to give you a quick uh, breakdown on how this works, we are gonna play an engine sound. I've got two hints here. Zach and I have no idea what this is. Producer Chase has picked this for us. We have sourced the engine sound from one of our audience members. Uh, please keep in mind, if you want to play along at home, now is the time to start screaming at your stereo speakers that you know what it is and we don't and we're idiots. Uh, so without any further ado, here is the engine sound. Guest honors get to go first. Whew. Is that a, a fuel pump before the start up there? Yeah. So it sounds I like listened to the I listened to the fuel pump a few times to try to like, does that sound familiar? But I didn't really get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, playing it again here. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, take take another listen. Everybody take another listen. It starts a little higher and then kind of settles down into the idle a little bit. Does anyone want to take a guess before I give us the first hint? <laughs> what? It, well, let's let's start. With, well, I like to start with the basics. How, how many how many cylinders are you hearing, Ryan? <laughs> he's deep. He's deep in it. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, how, I'm, how many I'm, how many cylinders are you hearing? I'm deep in it. Is is that a? Uh, Oh, hold on. I've lost you guys. There you are. Um, <laughs> is that a fast revving single? No. Is it? I could be. I think it's a twin. You think it's a twin? I, 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 uh, uh, I don't, I'm going, I'm going with, uh, MT-07. No, I, I, I'm with Ryan on this a little bit. I think this sounds more like, a. I don't know. It's either, it's either a, a single or it's a it's a V twin. I don't. I'm not hearing parallel twin. Okay. I'm I'm gonna stick with my fast revving single. Uh, nice. I like it. Moonshot here. Let me listen one more time. <laughs> I, I've just I've just allocated another five minutes to this uh, in, my, <laughs> uh, in my daily calendar. So don't uh, don't worry about signing off quick. All right. So Ryan's listening one more time. He's thinking <laughs> it is a fast revving single. I have hit number one. In my hand. Are you ready for awesome. hit number one, Ryan? Let's hear it. Hit number one is popular with beginners. 
loved by veterans. Uh oh. SV650. <laughs> at first, at first, I thought that's. I, at first, I was going to read veterinarians, and I was like, no, no, that's not right. That <laughs> yeah, makes yeah. no sense. Very popular with people who work with animals. <laughs> yeah. So popular uh, with beginners, loved by veterans. So we're we're in the we're, we're in the. Um, we're in the the SV650 MT07 yeah. like like family of motorcycles somewhere right because that's a you know popular with beginners loved by veterans those those bikes qualify i would say totally i'm starting to walk back my fast single idea <laughs> and i think to be clear i never believe, i never thought that yeah. <laughs> to be to be clear we're talking about uh, veteran motorcycles people that have ridden motorcycles for a long time not veterans not as people in that fought in the persian military. gulf exactly. correct okay yep. um, do you, you guys hear anything else in this that uh, that well, is worth talking about. Is there any an, more? It's an aftermarket exhaust, signs? certainly. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. So, so that makes that makes it um, that makes it hard to that makes it hard to pick out. I think it's like a little bit harder to hear, uh, you know, a valve train or intake noise when the, when the exhaust is loud. Um, I just know that it it sounds it sounds peppy, um, and um, I, I often, whenever I, I hear a, a Yamaha Tenere 700, MT-07, mm. Yamaha R7 with a pipe on it, I always think, man, that's a that's a spunky, cool sound. It sounds very similar to an SV650. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this, and again, I, I was kind of back and forth between Ryan Ryan's single versus V-twin. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go V-twin. I'm not. I'm, I don't think it's parallel twin. I think it's it's V-twin. That's fair. It, that's a good. That's, it it revs up pretty fast. Like it zing, spools up. Uh, yeah. Quick, so yeah. maybe yeah. Uh, an over square V twin, liquid cooled, something kind of performance oriented. SV six fifty. All right, hit um, number two then. I'm gonna flip it over. Question. So we've do got it, do it. Tell hit us, number Birch, two. Tell us. The model, quote in general, is 24 years old. Uh, oh, that's starting to that's sound. Uh, starting to sound like is the SV six fifty that old? I mean, it must be, right? It is. I think it's it is. 1999. Yep. Oh, oh, that's 24 years. All right, let's. I, the hints over. are pretty generous on this one. No. <laughs> they are, it's like, they are, yeah. It was once a gladius. <laughs> <laughs> Means tiny sword in. Uh, no. Uh, so, in 2004, SV 650S is the answer. All I want right, to give a shout well out done. to Tim. Well oh, done, I just, Zach. Yeah, I think I think you guys were Zach. You were on the the small displacement bike. I was just on V twin and trying to agree with Ryan. So, yeah, um, I mean, I know I I was I was I was thinking fast single. So I'm um, uh, bow to the, <laughs> the 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 better authority there. Um, All right. Well, Tim is the one that sent this in. It is a 2004 Suzuki SV 650S with a competition works slip on exhaust. Mm, so thank mm. you to Tim for. Playing the engine sound, guessing in with Ryan, Zach, and myself today. Just a reminder to everybody out there in the audience, if you want to have a chance of having the uh, the tail end of your motorcycle featured on the high side, low side <laughs> engine guessing game, send in the year, make, and model along with any mods. We need a 30-second clip. Get us the bike starting. Get the bike idling. A few good revs, idle, and you are done. You send it over to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. Our producer, Chase, mans that email uh, every day. He's in there checking to see what you've sent us. And, uh, yeah, another successful Oops. engine sound guessing game. Ryan, you are no longer uh, a virgin to the game. Good for you. <laughs> no, indeed. I am uh, not a virgin, but I feel a bit like a failure, so I want to play again. we got nice. we got to have another podcast as I'm most okay. advocating as for, for a round two. You're that's, not the only one. Most most virgins feel like a failure the first time that they <laughs> they pop that cherry. So you're Indeed. you're amongst a lot of us. I'm glad I teed um, you up for that one. Just perfect. I'm glad you <laughs> <laughs> made the connection there. And you should know that that's basically how we feel every time we play the game. Uh, is <laughs> We get done and we think, ah, give me another one. I can do it next time, yeah. boss. I can do it next time. I swear um, I got it. I swear I can do it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, uh, all things considered here today, thank you so much for donating your time to talk about electric vehicles. Um, I do hope um, the audience had as much fun as I did uh, ranting and raving about all this stuff. And um, we are currently over time uh, that, that you allotted to us for this podcast, so we very much appreciate it. We would like to remind people, if you'd like to send Ryan fan mail to highsidelowside at revzilla.com, feel free to do that too. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, see if we can fill uh, Revzal's inbox with uh, Fort Nine praise. That would uh, give me a, a particular sort of joy. <laughs> I bet you knowing would. that you guys have to yeah. open those up. That's all the time we have for today. <laughs> Certainly, do not send us an email to high side low side at revzilla.com telling us how much you love Ryan. Ryan, get the hell off the program. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for having me, guys. It's always a, an absolute joy to uh, to chat with you guys. Uh, be uh, be happy to do this again anytime all right man we'll talk to you soon maybe in another season or so we'll get you back on for hydrogen <laughs> hey is yo, that the do. future <laughs> <laughs> see you buddy see ya all righty always a pleasure to have ryan on the podcast i think we can agree um uh, he's it always comes at things with a different angle i never quite see it coming and um i appreciate that about him that being said we need to to pivot to uh, give a T-shirt away. Spurge, how do people win T-shirts here on High Side, Low Side? Please give the ladies and gentlemen a reminder. Absolutely. You leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. We take it very seriously. We thank you for all the people out there that have left us very kind reviews. Uh, Zach and I do our best to read through all of them, and we love the feedback. Um, we love it even better when it's nice, but especially because it does help <laughs> other people find the show, uh, and it just helps to make the show a little bit better. So the winner today mm. is... Hexodyne, uh, who wrote in and said, after a marathon of listening over the last two weeks and suffering some sort of mental health ramifications for doing so, I have been inspired to dig my garage art, in quotes, 1990 Yamaha FZR1000 out of the garage after 15 years. It's amazing what has and hasn't changed in the motorcycle industry since I stopped riding or paying attention. I'm eyeing a Tenere as an addition to my stable, um, but with Spurgeon being such a KTM fanboy, I'm actually looking at their line as well. Wow. Uh, you are welcome, Hexadyne. Um, <laughs> and he just says, uh, keep up the great work, Chris. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That's uh, nice to say. We like this little tale of... Um, of you know rejuvenation in in two wheels chris it sounds like used to ride around a bit had an fzr 1000 just sitting around collecting dust um or you know on display just depending on how you look at it uh and uh, was inspired due to the damage to his brain from listening to all the high side low side to dig out the bike from the garage it's a great story it's a it's a lovely tale and we would love to send you a t-shirt chris uh for your troubles and um and uh for the way you have buoyed our spirits this week so please do send your preferred t-shirt size and your mailing address to high side low side at revzilla.com and we'll send you over a t-shirt all right so now we're going to move on to the high side low side comment of the day uh this was sent in via email by Sean T. from Long Island, New York. Zach, why don't you go ahead and take the message from Sean? Yes, indeed. Sean says, <clears throat> and I quote, I appreciate the engine sound game, but I'm amazed by some of the conclusions you're able to draw. For example, in a recent episode, you listened to the initial play of an engine recording, and one of you said, it's a two-cylinder, and the other immediately agreed. What did you hear? I've been around motorcycles for a few years now, and I'm okay with a wrench, but I can't identify an engine sound beyond the Harley Davidson potato potato, uh, the high buzz of an electronic fuel injector, the rattle of a dry clutch, stuff like that. Could you teach your audience about what you are hearing? Spurgeon, what can you tell? What, what, do, what do we say to Sean here? This is a good question, and it's a Great fun question. one. We wanted to address it, obviously, but I'm, I'm struggling with what to say. Well, long know. story short, Sean, we can't teach you because we can't <laughs> teach ourselves. And, and because I thought an SV650 was an MT07, so like, yeah. what do I know? What, what I will say is, one, Zach's actually probably better at this than, than I am. Um, but we were, we were kind of going back and forth and we agreed that your question was really great. We agreed that we, we, it was worth some, you know, context and, and some discussion on the program, but it really just comes with time. I, yes. I, I, Zach and I, for the past, you know, uh, I would say, oh, I don't know, 20 something years for me and probably 30 something years for Zach have been around motorcycles, um, you know, as, as, as riders, let alone the amount of motorcycles that I've been around before I was a rider and same with Zach. So I think it really just comes with time and exposure to all the different makes and models out there. And I think it also bears mention, Sean, that if you have been riding for 25, 30 years on the same motorcycle, and that's all you hear all the time, and, and maybe you're not in a, in a big group of other people out there riding, 
you're not getting exposure to different kind of motorcycles. So it's not just time, but it's also like how many different motorcycles are you being exposed to? And I don't know if I don't know if you can teach that per se, Zach. Yeah, it's, it's certainly it's just it's just seat time, you know, and it uh, and it's certainly, uh, you know, some some stuff is really tricky, right? Like uh, like these uh, 270 crank parallel twins that we're seeing a lot of in the motorcycling world with a 90 degree crank pin mm. offset, such as uh, Honda Africa Twin, a Yamaha uh, MT-07 Tenere R7 uh, uh, Triumph Bonneville's or 90 degree 90 degree crank pin offsets. Um, the 90 degree crank pin offset sort of mimics. Uh, it's a parallel twin, but it mimics the the character in the sort of um, uh, firing order of uh, a V twin, or it mimics the sound and the character of a 90 degree V twin, and that makes it really hard to tell the different like this the the end in sound guessing game we just did, where it was an SV650, and I thought it was an MT07 because I I couldn't uh, couldn't tell the difference. So some stuff is really tricky. I think as far as like telling how many cylinders a bike has, you know, you can. It's just a matter of like. Uh, of of listening to an inline four, listening to an inline triple, listening to a parallel twin, listening to a single, and sort of like and familiarizing yourself with the cadence of of what it sounds like. And certain engines you're just like really intimately familiar with. A couple episodes ago, or maybe it was last episode, I don't remember, um, uh, with Spencer on there, with uh, producer Chase picked a 1981 BMW R80 GS, right, 800 cc. BMW air cooled flat twin. A bike that I knew Spencer ex- owns. He does not. That's not the point here. The point is, my dad owns that bike, that very bike. Um, it's had different mufflers on it over the court over the many years that it's been in our family. But I've heard that bike start up so many times that as soon as I heard the starter motor turn, as soon as I heard the valve train clickety clack in there, I just knew what it was. And it's just it's just from hearing it so many times. So, But, but the it, flip side of that, so Sean doesn't feel bad, is that that is a bike that Spencer owns, and correct. he didn't get it right out of the gate. He thought it was, I think he yeah. said Harley Davidson. So it's, <laughs> it's even, even as we're thinking about the bikes that, that we have in our garage, um, I would like to believe that if I heard uh, a KTM V-Twin uh, or a... <laughs> Triumph Bonneville or a Triumph Tiger 800 engine, but I think we actually had a, a parallel twin wait, wait. 790 on here, and I didn't yeah. get it. And you didn't right twig myself. It. Yeah, it's tough. So. It's a tough one. So the bottom line is we're we're not we're not savants. We're not amazing at it. Uh, it's it's just uh, it's a it's a matter of sort of what you've heard and what you're used to hearing. Um, but I love. The, one of the reasons I love this um, this comment and this question, Sean, is I like that you're you're digging at it. Like, how do you, how do you get better? You know, I like the idea that when you hear a bike now coming down the street and you can't see it, you'll be thinking in your head like, oh, I wonder what that is. I'm going to work on it and like try to dissect the the sound. I think it's a, that's a fun idea. And um, I'm sorry that we couldn't give you any really juicy tips on how to do it, but um, I love that you're thinking about it. And uh, I like the suggestion that you get a kick out of the engine sound guessing game because uh, we're having a lot of fun with it here. Absolutely, and I think as long as, as long as we're keeping in mind that we're all doing this for fun, uh, you know, that's that's <laughs> and we're all not that, really, that mad when yeah, we don't get it. Exactly. So I mean, let's just let's just keep that in mind, Sean. Hopefully, if nothing else, it's it's helping you train your ear um, to yes. all the different engine sounds that are out there yeah, and available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so with that being said, <laughs> keep in mind that uh, you can leave a comment on YouTube. You can shoot us an email to high side low side at revzilla.com. Um, share share the game, share the podcast with your friends, leave us an Apple podcast review. But if you have somebody out there that's in your riding community uh, that might not know who High Side Low Side is uh, or have listened to the program, feel free to let them know that, you know, they can play along to the engine sound guessing game themselves if they if they tune in. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Okay, Spurge, it's that time of the podcast. What uh, what's your big what's your big takeaway today? What, uh, what what do you feel like you learned? I'll be honest. <laughs> for those of you that are watching right now on the screen, or for those of you that are listening, I'm going to paint you a picture with my words. Behind me is that uh, that old Kawasaki chassis sitting back there. Nice. I and think I'm, I know where you're going with this. I'm looking at what Ryan did with that Suzuki frame, yeah, yeah. and I'm thinking maybe I take 1500 bucks and I buy some batteries from China, and <laughs> I stick it in that thing, and I make a little electric vehicle, and then Ryan and I meet up somewhere on an undisclosed location, and... Uh, and we race our homemade electric uh, motorcycles. That's that's quite an idea. Or I, it's, in, it's, in more of the spirit of the podcast, maybe we don't race them. Maybe we just ride them slowly uh, around town until the batteries go dead, and we drink some uh, some coffee and eat some, some lager. donuts. Yeah, <laughs> some some tea as he some tea. Uh, evidently he's a, enjoys. He's a big tea drinker. You're right. Big yep. tea drinker. Yeah. 
Um, what about you, Zachary? What have you learned today? Well, by gosh, I didn't. I wouldn't have thought, as you pointed out, that catalytic converters are getting stolen in Canada too. It's one thing to be here in Los Angeles and have the the catalytic converter get ripped out of the bottom of my wife's car from our driveway, as it did. I even I even caught the little scamps in the in the middle of it, chased them in my underwear. I did. Um, but um, <laughs> what a sight to be seen! Uh, but uh, to be a neighbor of Zach Quartz on that day. Oh. <laughs> uh, but. Um, you know, uh, Canadians stealing, still stealing catalytic converters from each other. What has the world come to? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought it. Um, but, uh, but I did, I did learn, uh, a thing or two about the international community. Thanks to Ryan, uh, being on, on the program. And, I, blame, uh, I blame it on TikTok. It a Just destroying uh, society. Totally. Yeah. Canadians used or, to be so nice. <laughs> well, they're just probably ticked off because... They don't have Trader Joe's, mm. but that's another podcast. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for hanging out with us and talking about electric motorcycles. Uh, we we had uh, probably more fun than you did listening. Uh, we appreciate you hanging around. We will see you next time on Hot Side, Low Side with another topic and uh, perhaps another guest or maybe just the two of us. Yeah, and, and shout out and thank you to Ryan from Fort Nine for, for taking the time out of his busy schedule and joining us to uh, to bring this to the, the masses. Indeed. See you next time, everybody.